hear from candidates on key issues that touch their lives so they can make informed decisions at the polls. The League is a nonpartisan organization that does not support or oppose any specific political party or candidate. The views expressed in each forum are those of the candidates, not those of the League of Women Voters, or SPNN. Following the forums, the League of Women Voters of Minnesota and our local league chapters will post the complete, unedited recordings to YouTube and the League's website. Editing is authorized only for official media reporting. Excerpts or edited clips of candidate forums may not be used for partisan or other political purposes. Please hold your applause until the end of the forum. Any disruptive, disrespectful, or intimidating behavior will not be tolerated. Audience members engaging in this type of behavior will be asked to leave. We believe the success of our city depends on our our state depends on the values, knowledge, and commitment of our elected officials. Thus, it is essential for the public to better understand the views, opinions, and commitments of candidates running for elected office. This understanding better equips voters to make informed decisions according to their values and interests. We appreciate candidates and the audience for taking the time to be with us tonight. You may all have noticed there are cards on your chairs. Those cards are for writing down questions for the candidates to answer. Once you have a question, please hold it up and one of our volunteers will pick it up from you. Without further ado, let's introduce the candidates for Minnesota House District 66A and 66B. Running to represent 66A, please welcome Lee Finke, Lee, thank you for being here. And Fadel Jama, thank you for being here, candidate Jama. Running to represent 66B, please welcome Greg Copeland. Good welcome, night. Mr. Copeland. And Miss Athena Hollins. Welcome, Miss Hollins. The candidates participating in today's forum have all agreed upon the forum rules, which are as follows. Firstly, campaign materials including buttons, signs, literature, and clothing are not allowed in the studio, but you can find candidate materials on the table in the lobby. Each candidate will give a two-minute introductory statement. The candidates will have one minute to answer questions and 30 seconds for a rebuttal if necessary. A timer will signal the candidates when they have 15 seconds remaining and when their time is up. Candidates may complete their sentence, but then should relinquish the mic. We will accept written questions throughout the forum. Questions submitted by the audience must be applicable to all candidates, nonpartisan in nature, and must be topics relevant to the office. Again, if you have questions, please write it on the card, hold it up, and one of our volunteers will collect it. Questions that are of personal nature, embarrassing, hostile, or unclear in intent will not be asked. Similarly, questions may be consolidated and or edited for clarity or brevity. Please remain as quiet as possible so that everyone may hear. Please hold your applause until the forum has ended so that candidates will have as much time as possible to answer your questions. Please check now and make sure your cell phones are silent. Members of the media may be recording this forum for their own use. The forum is also being recorded by the St. Paul Neighborhood Network for viewing by the public. We ask that members of the public not make their own recordings or take photos of the forum while it is in progress. With that, we will start with opening statements. And we will start with Candidate Finke has the first opening statement. Thank you very much. Thank you to the League of Women Voters and SPNN for putting this on. Thank you to everyone who uh, joined us here tonight or is watching at home uh, for participating in our democracy. My name is Lee Finke. My pronouns are she, her, hers. 
and I represent District 66A in the Minnesota House of Representatives. I was elected for the first time two years ago and served for the past two years in the DFL House and Government Majority. It's an honor to serve in the House of Representatives, and I am very grateful for the opportunity that has been given to me. I am looking for re-election, and I am asking for your support tonight to go back and continue the work that we have done. A little about me, my work is driven by two primary objectives. The first is the protection of civil rights. Uh, in the Minnesota House, we prioritized abortion and reproductive justice, as well as I, I prioritized as the chair of the Queer Caucus and as a trans person, uh, the extension of civil rights to the LGBTQ community. And we did a significant amount of work to protect women and queer people and our bodily autonomy. We also prioritized uh, very much so the protection of individual liberties of our community with disabilities, our neighbors who are incarcerated, everybody's rights across the board to make sure that we were not leaving anyone behind. Personally, I also uh, prioritize and carry the bills related to tree and urban tree canopy. That's a very big priority for me. I moved the legislation to take care of the emerald ash borer. We have a billion ash trees. We're gonna lose them soon if we don't do something, and that's extremely important to me. And uh, yeah, I look forward to sharing more about my priorities going forward, and thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Next candidate, Jama. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for being here. My name is Fidel Jama. I'm running to represent District 66A in the Minnesota House of Representatives. I'm running because, like many of you, I know how hard it is to build a better life. I've been through it, and I understand the struggles of our community. I came to this country as a legal immigrant and a refugee. Starting from the bottom, I worked at Amazon and went to school, complete my nursing. I became a nurse in 2020 during the pandemic. I learned a lot during the pandemic from my community and the support the neighborhood have for each other. I later started my own small business to give back and help people around me. These experiences prepared me to solve problems to the, and focus to issues that matter the most, such as uh, helping small businesses grow, keeping our neighborhood safe, and uh, making government work for us. I support legal immigration, but we need to fix illegal immigration issues. Right now, one party control Minnesota, and we need more balance in our state government. I believe I will bring a fresh perspective, a voice in St. Paul, and a solution for everyone. Uh, together we can make life better to all of us in District 66A. Thank, Thank you. you. Now we will go to candidate Copeland. Good evening, folks, and thank you for coming. And I want to thank the League for actually having this forum. Without them, I don't know that we would have had another debate in this town. Imagine that. Uh, you know, I, I want to do something a little differently uh, than our uh, incumbents uh, who did a lot to uh, increase our taxes. I want to make things more affordable for the people that live in not only District 66B, but the people around the whole state, because we're all sharing in the expense of what's been going on down at the Capitol. Uh, one of the things I think that we need to do affects our city, and that is cut our property taxes. These property taxes are affecting the ability of people to retain home ownership. Uh, there's an awful lot of discussion at the Capitol about how we get people to own a home. But there seems to be precious little appreciation 
for the costs of home ownership that we have to bear because of the policies that these folks, uh, the incumbents, uh, have voted for. And it seems to me we need to do something different. Here's my plan. I want you to think about this. 50% of our uh, people here in St. Paul uh, are below what we have as a median income, the halfway point, okay? So for a, a single uh, person, we're talking about $38,000 for a couple, about 42, and uh, for a family of four, I think it's about 68. And what I'd like to do is for people who are in that income bracket, whichever one it is, below 50%, that they would get a credit on their tax statement for the property tax of 50%. And that may sound rather bold, but the reality is that when we have subsidized housing through the Met Council, what do they use as the measure? 50% of median income. So I want to extend the benefit of home ownership to everybody. Thank you. Next, we will go to candidate Hollings. Thank you so much. I want to thank the League of Women Voters for um, taking the time to do this forum. Um, it's one of my favorite parts of running every two years. Uh, my name is Athena Hollins. I currently rep represent District 66B. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And I am running for my third term um, within the, for the DFL seat. Um, I primarily focus on climate and energy issues and environmental issues in the um, House of Representatives. Um, and I also was the majority whip for the past two years, which is the third highest position in the caucus. Um, and I will tell you it was the greatest honor and the most difficult job of my entire life. Um, I absolutely love and respect this position and I love being able to represent my constituency and to bring their concerns to the Capitol. Um, we like to fight hard for the things that we believe in and the things that are gonna benefit folks. Um, in particular, I'm always looking at things through with an eye for equity um, because that's my background. I'm a lawyer by trade, but I worked in diversity, equity, and inclusion. And certainly in our community, in District 66B, there is a lot of inequity. And I will say, um, you know, the North End and the East Side have been historically disinvested in, and that's part of what I'm trying to bring back, is making sure that we invest in those communities, we invest in those people, and make sure that they're able to thrive in the same way that, say, a Highland Park area is able to thrive. Um, I, I want to talk very briefly about who I am personally, because it's important. I'm a mother. I have two young children who go to St. Paul Public Schools, and I'm very proud of that. And I'm also a wife. Um, and I owe so much to my husband, and hopefully if he is watching this later, he knows that I appreciate everything that he has done for me to be able to be here. But I look forward to the rest of the conversation and um, hope you all came up with some great questions. Thank you, candidates. Now the first question. Education is on the mind of our audience. Many studies have shown that after the pandemic, our school-aged children are scoring historic lows in reading and math competency. Teacher pay is low, as is re teacher retention. What can the state do to improve educational outcomes for our school-aged children? We will start with candidate Hollins. Much for the question. As I mentioned, this is a particularly important to me because I have two kids in the public school system. I also have a number of educators in my extended family, and so I get to hear a lot about the complaints from um, educators and teachers and the difficulties that they have in their job. Um, I mean, honestly, we have invested a huge amount, historic amounts in our education system, but we need to do more. Um, we know that there that we have not kept up with inflation as we move forward in our funding, and that is something that is absolutely critical. Um, we know that we've made changes now to account for the inflation going forward, but I also believe smaller class sizes, mandatory recess, and making sure that kids get the opportunity to do things that are not just reading, writing, and arithmetic, but also things like play, things like music, things like art, because those absolutely feed into what kids learn in those three fundamentals. And without those, you know, I know my kids get antsy and don't want to sit still for a long period of time. So I think everybody would benefit from that. Thank you. Candidate Copeland, your turn. Yes. Thank you. 
Uh, frankly, I think we're uh, in the midst and have been for some years of educational malpractice in St. Paul. Uh, we are doing things that just are not working. 70% round numbers, uh, and it's more or less, depending on whether it's math or reading, just aren't performing even at minimum standard levels. The schools are not working. And if you need any extra proof, you can talk to the citizens that have decided to move their children into charter schools by the thousands. Uh, in St. Paul, I remember when we used to have 45,000 kids in the school system. We don't have anything like that now. It's maybe 30. And then we have leadership that is really in question. We had a superintendent who was named superintendent of the year for the whole state. What does he do? He packs his bags and moves to uh, Wisconsin and then tells us, oh, by the way, I'm leaving you a $100 million uh, budget hole on a billion dollar budget. Uh, that is not leadership and we have a problem there. Okay, candidate Jama. Our kids deserve a good education that helped them succeed in life. We should focus on basic skills like reading, writing, math, so they could later on get a good paying job. I also support uh, more choices for parents to choose what is the best education for their children, either private school and others. My opponent pushed for political idea in schools. We need to make sh sure our classrooms are for learning, not political ideology. Let's prepare our kids for life, not political ideology. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we're going to go to public safety. Well, I'm sorry, I crossed your name off already and missed you. Yeah, it happens. Candidate, thank you. I'm yes, so thank sorry. you so much. Um, that's all right. Um, what we need to do to improve our schools is recognize that we have a generation or two of underfunding that we need to restore. We put in $2 billion into our education system while we had the majority. Uh, it is a, only a fraction of the spending that we need to do if we are going to close this gap. We cannot pretend like we can move the same pieces around and assume that we can find a magic puzzle that's going to finally solve this problem. We need to pump money into our schools so that we have schools that have nurses and mental health support, but we also have teachers, enough teachers to have small classes, as you heard. We need gym, we need recess. As you heard, these things are essential for our students. If you want your students to learn how to read, they need to be able to run around a little bit. And I also have students in SBPS public schools. I also am concerned about the drain of students into our charter schools, and I think we need to make sure we take a very serious look at how that's harming our public schools and take real action to continue to prioritize all of our students. Thank you. Next question will go to public safety. Police and first responders are mostly provided by city and county governments, not by the state of Minnesota. What role, if any, should the state take to ensure public safety and reduce crime for all citizens, whether immigrants, LGBTQ persons, people of color, non-English speaking people, and all of our communities. And we will start this question with Jamal Jama. I mean, Mr. Jack, candidate Jama. Hey, no problem, thank you. Uh, everyone deserve to feel safe in their community and their neighborhoods. We need to support our law enforcement and police, and at the same time have programs to prevent crimes and reduce crime. We have higher number of crimes. Before it happens, uh, I will make sure our neighborhoods are safe for our families. My opponent idea is to defund the police and uh, abolish the police. There's no ideas to support our police and work together to reduce the crimes. 
To me, safety is a right, not an option. Thank you. Next candidate, Finke. safety for all of our citizens equally and without discrimination. Um, I think that we can see if we are honest about what the investments that the legislature and the government has put into our public safety programs, we can see a very clear success. Crime is down in every single category across the state and across the country. We are making incredibly important strides in this way, but we also know that our public safety system is not equitable. It is not providing the same resources and the same safety to all of our communities. And we do need to make sure that we are thinking clearly and training appropriately for all the safety of all of our communities. We know that that is not true. We have the data. We have seen the data in Minneapolis. We know how racist the police have been in Minneapolis. And we know that we can fix it. And we are seeing it fixed. I truly believe we are but we shouldn't pretend as though there is not a real problem that needs to be solved. We took that problem seriously at the legislature and crime is significantly dropping. Thank you, candidate Finke. Next, candidate Copeland. Yes, uh, you know, I had the uh, honor of being the city manager in Maplewood for a couple of years. And uh, the number one priority that the council wanted to place uh, on me was what can we do to create more public safety? And so what we did is we reorganized city government. And we got rid of uh, about $750 million worth of uh, assistance to assistance of an administrative nature. I'm talking about the assistant directors. And we hired policemen. And we hired firemen. And we hired EMS folks. And we, ex we actually even hired the first code enforcement officer in the 50-year history at that time of the city. So public safety is very important, but it's not just limited to hiring police. It's also about dealing with problems like lead pipes. How are our children going to be safe when the pipes in 26,000 households in this city of St. Paul have lead lines? The answer is they're not. We need to do something about that. Candidate Hollins. Thank you so much. This is a really important question and it's something we spent a lot of time thinking about the legislature. I've sat on the public safety committee for the past four years and what we want to recognize is that public safety isn't just police officers. It is so much more than that. Um, I worked on a, on a bill for copper wire theft, right? Because when people are stealing copper wire out of our uh, lights outside, our street lights, folks are less safe. They feel less safe walking down the road. They are more likely to be hit by cars. They are more likely to get in trouble and be, you know, ex experience crime. Um, we also worked on funding ambulances in greater Minnesota because that's no longer a lucrative thing to do. They can't make money off of ambulances picking up people in greater Minnesota, which means we had to subsidize that cost. But that's still a part of public safety. You want grandma and grandpa to be safe even if they live out in rural Minnesota. And the third thing I want to say is common sense gun laws are so important and we've been working on this for years and years. We need to keep deadly weapons out of the hands of bad actors. And that's something that we can do at the state level that will keep more people safe. Thank you. The next question we will start with candidate Copeland and the question is what do you think the state should or should not be doing to address climate change? You know, my, is this on? Okay. Uh, on climate change, I, I prefer to think of this as a problem that actually reflects itself in our environment. Uh, we have, uh, you know, the deer tick problem. It's like it's ever been like this before. The carp problem. The uh, encephalitis with the, with the deer. Uh, the uh, ash borer. All of these environmental things that are going on uh, we have the zebra mussels. Uh, you know, those are things I think that we can deal with, and we don't have to have the, the big debate about how warm Minnesota is. Uh, I don't know, but I think probably uh, a, a little warmer down here and a little colder up north uh, is kind of what people want. But then again, we don't run the, the weather. That's somebody else's job. And uh, I'm not trying to uh, take his job away. Thank you. 
Candidate Hollins. Thank you. Um, this is an important question to me. It's near and dear to my heart. I have so many opinions about it, I can't possibly cover them all here. But what I will say is we know that in our district, there are things that need to happen to uh, mitigate and adapt to climate change. And one of the big ones is updating our building codes so that new buildings that are being built are more climate resistant for our ever-changing weather. And also making sure that folks are able to retrofit their old buildings and weatherize those older, and I'm old buildings and old homes, like my own, so that they are better insulated, they use less energy, energy and they are able to withstand all of the changing weather, whether it's flooding or excessive heat or excessive snow. Um, what I will say is that costs a lot of money, right? And the reality is we don't have the budget to do that. And that's why I'm really proud to be working on a polluters pay bill, which looks at having big oil be financially responsible for the damages that it's caused to the state of Minnesota. Because otherwise, it's gonna go onto the back of our taxpayers to be able to mitigate and adapt to climate change, and it shouldn't be paid by those folks. It should be paid by the people who have made billions of dollars off of climate change. And finally, candidate Finke. Not finally, right, there's still two more. You're right. Um, well, I am of the opinion that in order to address climate change, we should do everything. Uh, I think if we don't do everything, we end up in a position in 50 years where we won't be able to do anything. Uh, more specifically, you know, I know that this is a climate is going to be a very difficult problem for uh, state legislatures to solve. We need to do what Representative Holland said and make polluters pay. Uh, tax corporations that are spending stop subsidizing fossil fuel generation. Um, these are federal problems, but. Fossil fuels are subsidized at levels far, far, far beyond anything to do with anything related to clean energy. We need to make sure that the people who are creating this problem are paying to solve it. Uh, and at the local level, we need to make sure that we are attending to the quality of life of the people who live in our cities, uh, make sure that we have affordable, efficient places to live, make sure that we are planting those trees, make sure that we are doing everything we can to keep our air and our water clean so our people are healthy and we are able to make it until the polluters can pay to solve their problem. Candidate Jama. Thank you. I support clean energy, but we need to make sure it does not cost too much for families, especially working families. We should have a balanced plan that protect the environment and while keeping the cost low. I'm, I used to be a, and still a business owner. We could have a budget that afford us clean energy and use other energy sources. My opponent plan is we'll make energy bills higher for families. We need to protect the environment in a smart way that does not hurt the people wallets. Protecting our environment should not hurt our budget. Thank you. I'm sorry. Yes. Um, so one of the brilliant things about this time period that we're living in is that clean energy is actually more affordable than fossil fuels are. Extracting fossil fuels, and especially the amount that we have to, uh, how far we have to bring them to get them to the state of Minnesota, is actually not cost effective anymore. We live in the wind belt, where we can create more clean wind energy than we can even use. And we're able to export that wind energy to other places. So this is a really exciting time where it actually costs less for us to be proactive about our clean energy needs um, um, than it would be for us to go into fossil fuel. And for candidates, all of you, if you do choose to rebut, please raise your hand and say rebuttal after the last person has spoken, so I'm sure to acknowledge you and I know what you want. Better communication that way, it's okay to speak up. All right, number, next question, number four. Oversight of state programs. Crisis in oversight of Minnesota programs has occurred with fraud and corruption being unearthed in a wide variety of state-run programs, including food programs, healthcare, and transportation. What can be done by the legislature to uncover these problems sooner and at less cost to the taxpayer? And we will start with candidate Finke. We need to have, 
<laughs> we need clear oversight of these programs. We need to make sure that the money that is going out is being spent. We need audits. We need clear, capable people in charge of the programs that we are both funding to give those grants and then people who are receiving those grants. There's no excuse for any of this fraud. There's no excuse for any of what we have seen, what we are seeing in the news, what we are seeing in the courts. It is a disaster. It is not something that anybody is out here trying to do, right? The, the simple idea is that if we are spending money, that money needs to be spent responsibly and for the reason that it is being given. If it is not, then we need to immediately cease those funds. I'm not sure where, excuse me, that's an errant thought. There's no doubt that we all agree that the kind of waste and fraud we have seen just needs to stop. And it, we can't legislate people who are bad behavior, but we can make sure that the money stops immediately when we discover bad behavior. Thank you. And next, candidate Jama. Thank you. As I told you earlier, I run a small business. I know the meaning of spending, budget, fiscal responsibility, oversight, having a balanced budget, uh, how to use money wisely. I will work to cut wasteful spending and make sure we spend our tax money on things that really help the people. My opponent keep spending without thinking about waste. We need leaders who knows how to manage money better. Our tax money is not for wasting. And we need oversight because fraud and abuse is rampant. And as I told you, Minnesota is ruled by one party and they do not do any oversight. Thank you. Candidate Copeland. Yes, uh, you know, in a uh, prior uh, life, I was a, a contract compliance officer and had the uh, job to go out to the job site where there were contracts. This was for a uh, job training organization and uh, monitor what was going on. Talk to the participants. Be there when they're getting their service. It wasn't uh, meals as it is in the case of the fraud here in Minnesota. But, you know, if you don't go out to the job site, then you don't really know what's going on. And that's part of the problem. This is very simple, actually. And it, it appears that people administering the programs don't know how to do that kind of work. Uh, and it's, it's work, and it's tedious, and you're not always appreciated when you get to the job site because, oh, they think you're coming here to find something out. Well, maybe if somebody had visited those sites, and maybe if the executive leadership of our state, Governor Walsh, had actually done his job and told his uh, managers to manage their programs, we wouldn't have a quarter million dollars in fraud. We'd have kids eating food instead of criminals in a courtroom in Minneapolis. Candidate Hollins. Thank you. So I think we all agree here that fraud and waste is bad. And so I'm gonna go on a different uh, tangent with this question because I honestly think that part of this issue is that we have outsourced so many of the basic functions of government to these nonprofit entities that we no longer have the ability to provide proper oversight. I mean, is it the responsibility of nonprofits to be feeding children or should we be feeding children as the government? Is it the responsibility of nonprofits to be providing childcare or should we be directly providing childcare as the government? I think that's a real question that we need to ask because the oversight that exists right now, you would have to put almost as much oversight into the system to oversee the things that are happening by nonprofits. And if you don't wanna grow government, it doesn't actually make sense to do that. I mean, then you're just paying people to audit and oversee. And I think there's better ways to do this. Thank you. Next question, Metropolitan Council. The Metropolitan Council describes itself as the regional policy-making body, planning agency, and provider of essential services in the seven-county Twin Cities metro area. Our mission is to foster efficient and economic growth for a prosperous region. The members of the Met Council are appointed by the governor 
Do you support legislation to make the Metropolitan Council an elected rather than an appointed body? Why or why not? And we will start with candidate Copeland. Yeah, this, this issue has been uh, kicked around by every administration and every political party and every legislature for years. And what have we got? We've got a overrun on the Green Line extension that is absurd. And frankly, uh, you know, I think we've got an agency in state government that knows how to build roads and other transportation facilities. And it's not the Met Council. It's the Department of uh, Transportation. And it seems to me that uh, that's the kind of change we need. We need some executive leadership about where we assign the task the government is to perform. I, I think the Met Council does a great job running the sewer system. I think they do a decent job even with the bus company, right? Because uh, it's not easy running all those buses during COVID when you don't have a full staff and people are sick. And I mean, the, the problems that are on the buses uh, and the, uh, uh, you know, transit line, uh, those, those need some attention. And they're trying, uh, and they kind of fouled out with the, the, the guy uh, recently, but, uh, you know, they could do it. Um, okay, well, anyway, thank I'll, you. I'll leave it there, thank you. And now we will go to candidate Hollins. Thank you. This is a complex issue that I haven't dug that, dug that much into, but I have talked to people on either side of the issue. And I will say, um, I don't know where I land on this. I see pros and cons on both sides. What I will say is that I doubt that it's going anywhere in the legislature anytime soon, because there is not agreement even within our own Democrat or DFL caucus. So I, I don't think that we have to worry about that being forthcoming. Thank you. Candidate Finke. I think that the, what, what the Met Council does is in, incredibly important. It is an incredibly important agency for the operation of the metro area. We need somebody thinking holistically about the metro, which has unique challenges, both in transit and urban planning and you know, managing our urban forests and all kinds of things that the Met Council does. Um, I also like Representative Hollins. I don't know that I mean, frankly, I don't know that going to an elected model versus an appointed model for the Met Council would solve the problems that what we are seeing. What we lack is a leadership on the direction we are trying to go and a, co a comprehensive understanding of what we are trying to build in the metro. And I think that is something that we can provide at the legislature. And we started to do that, I, think, I believe, in the last session. And we will continue to do that work going forward. Thank you very much. Candidate Jama. Thank you. Uh, simple question, simple answer. We need elected people. And the people could decide who's qualified for this position. We need leaders that representing the people and finding solution that makes sense. And the people will hold them accountable. When the governor appoint someone and then not oversight them and not follow up with them, there is fraud, there is abuse, and there is a program that is not being run well, and there is waste. It's time to elect people and uh, have these common sense solution back and simple. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next question, racial disparities. Minnesota continues to have some of the nation's highest economic and social disparities between its white residents and residents of color. What do you believe the state should do to address this racial disparity? And we will start with candidate Jama. I believe everyone deserve to be treated fairly and have the same opportunity. I will support policies that make everyone treated fairly and everyone in our district can succeed, no matter what is their background. And I think this city has a lot of wonderful policies and we need to bring people together and focus on unity, not on dividing us. Let's work for 
equal chances, but no more division. I, I'm an example of the American dream. I had it, and I could vouch that we are have an equal field to succeed. Thank you. Candidate Finke. We start by recognizing the lasting impacts of white supremacy across all of our cultural institutions. We just don't get anywhere by pretending that everyone is on equal footing, that everyone is starting from the same place, that everyone has access to the same resources. We look at the data, we talk to people, we live in the world, we use our senses, and we experience reality. And we know that there are extreme inequities built into our system, whether it's black maternal health, whether it's pretextual stops from the police, everywhere you look, economic outcomes, home ownership, racial disparities are everywhere. And the only way for us to solve those problems is to acknowledge that they are real and to recognize that we need to build new solutions. We will not simply wait out the rot of white supremacy. We must fix it and cure it and put our country onto a pathway where everyone has a real chance to do what my opponent said, which is succeed in unity. Thank you. Candidate Copeland. Well, you know, before I uh, came to Minnesota 32 years ago, I went to college down in the southern part of the United States and in a rural community in Florida. And at that time, uh, that would have been 1972 to 76, uh, you know, the voter rolls still listed race next to your name. And I thought, well, that's a little strange. I, I came from New Hampshire, and we didn't do that. <laughs> so I don't think they're doing that in Florida anymore either. So, you know, all the white supremacists that uh, my uh, friend on the other end of the table wants to talk about, uh, they're going to keep talking about that because that's what they do. I think what we need to do is look at our school system because that's the future. And we need to do something about it rather than just talk about it because the inequities there are most gross, shall we say. I mean, we have 25% poverty in this town, more or less, depending on how you want to count it. And we have uh, thousands of children that this is their one chance and we shouldn't blow it. Thank you, and candidate Hollins. So one thing I want to note is that uh, Representative Finke was not talking about white supremacists. She was talking about white supremacy, which is a system that is based off of historic truths, such as redlining, such as keeping people from voting, um, myriad of different things, not allowing people to own businesses in certain areas or businesses at all, um, that is white supremacy. And I think that is very real. And part of what we're talking about um, as, as the candidate said, was that we want to fairly and same opportunities. But the reality is, if we take things fairly and the same right now, that does not account for historical inequities. Equity means helping people to get to where we can all be fair and have the same opportunities and have the same chance of succeeding. Right now, that is not what we have. So we need some deep systemic changes, and we also need programs that actively uplift individuals who have been harmed by white supremacy and have been harmed by racial discrimination. Things like allowing people who make under $85,000 to go to school, to go to college for free, um, the North Star program. Things like uplifting and giving grants to small businesses and building deeply affordable housing so that individuals are able to buy a home and actually live in it. Thank you. Did you want a rebuttal? Yes. Okay. okay. I want to say my opponent focused on issues like social justice, white supremacy, these topics divide us, you know. I came here as an immigrant, I walked my way up, there was everything equal, it did not seem off. Let's focus on the matter that unites us all. Let's focus on what matters is good jobs, safe streets, and government lis that listen to us. Thank you. And I would just like to comment to all of the candidates going forward. One of the rules of this forum is that we want to be forward looking and not personal in nature. So I would ask that none of you comment on what your 
uh, other candidates have said or have done in the past, but let's be forward looking as far as what you as a candidate focus on your own actions, what you think and feel should be done should you be elected. Thank you very much for that cooperation on that. Now, another question. Um, the Equal Rights Amendment. Should the Minnesota State Constitution have an Equal Rights Amendment? And what will you do to either encourage or discourage the passage of a state ERA? I will start with candidate Hollins. Short answer is yes, it should have an Equal Rights Amendment. We've been working on this for dozens of years and it's long past due. Um, I am personally committed to making sure that it gets a hearing in the House and that it passes in the House. I can't control what happens in the Senate, unfortunately, but I know that we're going to continue pushing forward with it. Next, candidate Copeland. Yes, uh, I, I attended the uh, rally that we had to stop the uh, last iteration of the uh, Equal Rights Amendment that included uh, language about, uh, oh, I think, what was it? Was there abortion in that or uh, gender equality and on and on it went. Uh, you know, it's one thing to talk about uh, equality and equity, and I know they're different before I get lectured. Um, but, you know, the, the reality is that we all want to enjoy life here in Minnesota. And uh, we have to have some mutual respect. And just because, uh, you know, you're in office doesn't mean that you get to, uh, uh, what, be not nice. I mean, I, I think it's, it's really wrong to take away the religious exemption, for example. I mean, you know, the, the idea that, uh, you know, a uh, Catholic hospital can't hire uh, a staff that uh, keeps its religious tradition is just as wrong as a, a Jewish institution that can't protect its religious tradition. So thank you. You're welcome. Candidate Jama. Thank you. I just want to say, uh, let's keep this platform forum fair across all sides. And uh, I would say uh, about this Equal Right Amendment, the reason why it did not pass, it, it, uh, it's not what it says it is. If you look or read between the lines, you will find out that it is not inclusive and it's not, it's uh, going against religious institution. As we know, we believe in separation between religions and the government. And we need to stay that way. We need to be inclusive. And uh, that's all. Thank you. Representative Finke. Yes, we do need to pass uh, the Equal Rights Amendment, the Equal Rights Amendment. Um, I would like to see passed is the one that we debated for 15 hours in the House of Representatives last year. Um, we do believe in the separation of church and state. It's one of the most fundamental, fundamental truths of this nation. Uh, Minnesota, in our constitution, we have the strongest religious protections of the entire country, stronger than the U.S. Constitution. There was no removal of anything to do with religious exemption. In fact, it is only getting stronger. The reason that people want to object to the ERA is because they do not want my community to have equal access and protections in the United States. That's it. If you want trans people to be oppressed, then you oppose the ERA in Minnesota. That is what we're talking about. I'm not going to pretend otherwise. We don't have to read between the lines. We're being honest. We want to protect abortion and queer people in the ERA, and I'm going to fight for it. Thank you. We'll switch topics. How about waste? <laughs> um, according to the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, the Twin Cities generates 3.3 million tons of waste each year. Our metro landfills have increased more than 30% in just one year. What would you do as a state legislator to address the issue of waste disposal in the metro area as well as statewide? And we will start with candidate Finke. I was hoping that you would start with 
candidate Hollins, who is an expert on this subject matter, but you will have your time. Uh, and the Environment Committee during the last session, we heard some really powerful and important and good policies, uh, shifting responsibility to the producer, producer responsibility, oh, I'm not sure what the O oh meant at the end, but that's what we need to do. That's where we're gonna make the people who are producing the waste responsible for what happens downstream to that waste. And other states have done this, and what we have seen is that when corporations are responsible for their garbage, they stop producing so much garbage. Packaging especially is a way to just immediately cut down on the waste that we produce downstream by not having small thing wrapped in plastic and a bigger thing wrapped in plastic. We don't need to do that, it's pretty obvious. A huge amount of our waste could be easily trimmed out of our system and by just putting the producer in, in uh, charge of reducing and paying for the waste stream. Um, that can be done in electronics, that can be done across all of, all of our uh, industries. Thank you. Candidate Jama. Thank you. I would say we have a big government, big government that is very slow and with a lot of regulation, a lot of red tapes, and they complicate things. If they leave some of the services to the private sector, to the free market, things will be sort itself. I believe we could uh, even save spending and eliminate waste at the same time. I would say uh, private sector is the solution. Not all, everything should be done by big government that is not, does not know how to oversight their own programs. Thank you. Candidate Copeland. Yeah, well, you know, uh, some years ago we used to have a uh, thing called the neighborhood, uh, what was it, I'm trying to remember the exact name, but the recycling operation was not run by the city. The uh, neighborhood consortium, that's what it was, uh, made the contract with the uh, haulers for the recycling, and we didn't pick up things that didn't have a market, like plastic. We weren't trying to fool everybody into thinking somehow that we're doing great things when there wasn't great things happening. And, you know, we're paying a whole lot more than we used to for that service. It's down on the alley now. We don't even separate the materials. It's, you know, so they're worth less money, frankly. Uh, and then we spent all kinds of money out there in Newport to build a new facility to uh, pretend to do more sorting. And yet, uh, you know, mix the stuff together and we've got the solid waste bill from uh, the city and we've got the recycling bill from the city. Uh, frankly, you know, we're, we're not getting the truth anymore and what we were doing in the old days actually worked. It didn't cost us as much money. Candidate Hollins. Thank you. I have so much to say on this issue, but I'm gonna try and keep it tight. Um, we have done a ton on solid waste and we are continuing to work on it. So in particular, I wanna, not in a mean way, but I, you know, candidate Copeland is right. Um, we do not have good labeling on our plastics, on our packaging. We don't actually know what's recyclable and not. That's why we have a bill it, for truth and labeling to require companies to actually label things correctly so that we know what is actually recyclable and what is not. And then we can be better consumers when we are purchasing things at the store. I also helped to fund an anaerobic digester, which will take organic waste from Ramsey County and Washington County and convert it into renewable natural gas. We're really excited about that project that's happening. It's going to be built out in Shakopee. And then finally, I've been been focusing a lot of my time and energy on electronics recycling and electronic waste because currently it's going into our regular waste stream where it's causing huge fires in facilities, it's catching trucks on fires, and it's being burned in incinerators or leaching uh, metals into the ground. And this is really an opportunity for us to become a hub for electronics recycling in the state of Minnesota and create revenue and jobs from this as opposed to waste that is poisoning our air and our groundwater. Thank you. Um, budget issues. How do you distinguish between needs and wants in spending or bonding bills? What are your budget priorities for the upcoming legislative session? And do you believe 
the state income taxes are too high? If so, how do you reduce them? So a big question about money. And we'll start with candidate Jama. Thank you. Number one, we need leaders who work across the aisle to find solutions. And uh, we need oversight. And then we will save waste, spending. If we cut spending, then we could reduce income tax, property tax. We will, could eliminate social security tax. And those could help the working family. Cutting waste is the solution. Uh, my opponent works between party lines, and that does not benefit anyone. We should bring the people agenda first, not politics. Let's bring common sense back to the government. Thank you. Candidate Copeland. Well, I keep going back to experience. Uh, I was on the uh, Long Range Capital Budget Improvement Committee here in St. Paul for, uh, was it six years or nine years? It was a long time, back when uh, Norm Coleman was mayor and uh, was vice chair there. And, uh, you know, there are only so many dollars. And uh, one of the things we, uh, and there's only so much time, and that's why I, I mention it, because one of the things we did is we knew that maintenance should be a big priority. You know, every politician wants to go to the ribbon cutting, but nobody wants to go to take care of the roof when it's leaking 20 years later. So a uh, comrade of mine on the uh, committee, he'd kill me for calling him a comrade, but anyway, uh, he and I came up with the idea, why don't we create a fund, $2 million a year, just to go to maintenance so we don't have to worry about what's going on in our state uh, you know, need something like that, I think, as well, because so much of our capital improvement is, should be directed to maintenance, and it's really directed toward ribbon cuttings. I, I guess I ran out of time. <laughs> okay, we will go to candidate Hollins. Thank you. So, I agree, maintenance is a huge issue, and it's not a sexy topic. We have several bridges in St. Paul right now that are way out overdue for being redone. And nobody wants to do that because it's not fun. Bridges aren't fun. Um, but they do keep people from being killed and falling into the water, so they're really important. And I know that one of the priorities of our bonding chair last year was a bill that he had brought that would require whenever a bonding bill is passed that the people who are receiving or the entity that's receiving that bonding money would have a 10-year plan for how they were going to pay for the maintenance and upkeep of those bonding projects. And I do think that's an actually really important aspect of it because it's really easy to say you want to build a sports arena on the north end but the cost of keeping up a sports arena is astronomical. And so we need to know how you're gonna do that without burdening our regular citizens and increasing their tax burden to do that. The other thing I wanna say is that we need to create a fourth tier of income tax. I mean, we have the wealthiest Minnesotans not paying a fair share, and that burden falls on regular people like you and I if they are not paying their fair share. So that is something we need to do in order to increase our funding. And now we will go to represent to candidate Finky. Thank you. Um, I want to start where Representative Athena ended. We need to increase taxes on those who have too much so that we can help those who need our help. The, the, the role of government is to help the citizens that it oversees live well. So when we think about our budget priorities, my priority for the budget is housing. We have an incredible housing shortage. It is not unique to St. Paul. It is not unique to Minnesota. It is going to be a crisis in this country for decades and decades to come. The first thing we need to do is provide stable, long-term housing for the people who want to live here because people want to live here. This is a great place to live. And people who cannot find a way to live here they don't find a place to live. I rent, I have rented for the last eight years. I would love to own a home. I'm hoping to uh, be able to do that in the near future, but it is very difficult to compete for a home in this market at every level. So the number one priority in the budget for me is housing. Okay, next question. 
I'm sorry. Rebuttal, go right ahead. Thank you. I just disagree with my opponent regarding increasing revenue or adding the tax bracket. It does not make sense. I think we have enough bu budget. The problem is with spending, with waste, abuse, and fraud. We could run an efficient government with the half of this budget. We don't have to add taxes, or tax brackets. We, we should reduce income tax. We should reduce, you know, the burden for the working families. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now we'll go with a new question on gun violence. Many are concerned with gun violence in our communities. What legislation, if any, would you support to meet the need for gun safety throughout the state of Minnesota? And we will start with candidate Jama. Thank you. As I said earlier, everyone needs to be safe in their environment, in their neighborhood. We need to have a, a safe environment without crime. We need to balance between constitutional right, the Second Amendment, at the same time, laws that make everything safe for our community. And I think we could do it, but the two sides need to work together. If one side majority is not talking to the other, then we cannot really have a dialogue and we cannot produce policies that really solve this issue and looking at the root causes because gun violence is real, we want safety, but we need to balance it between the right and constitutional rights. Thank you. Candidate Finke. Um, we passed significant gun legislation for the first time in a generation during the last two years uh, at the House. And this is something that we did, safe storage, red flags, others. Um, we did this because it was popular and people want to solve this problem. The, the Democratic Party, we talked to Republicans. We talked to the 60% of Minnesota Republicans who supported these bills. It's not up to us to get other people to vote for them. These are popular bills. I carried a bill to ban the sale of new ARs and other weapons of war that we do not need to sell in this state. That is a popular piece of legislation. It is not run afoul of any of our constitutional protections. We do not need to carry these. And I will, I will continue to fight against this gun epidemic. Then the number one cause of death in this country for people under 18 is gun violence. The number one cause of death for pregnant people in this country is murder. We have a problem and we can stop it. Candidate Hollins. Thank you. Um, Candidate Finke is right. We pass a number of different protections, red flag laws, background checks, um, increasing penalties for straw purchasers. That was all passed last year. We still do need to work on safe storage, which is something that I'm committed to. Um, the number of accidental shootings of children, school shootings, and veteran suicides is astronomical. And there is good research that shows that safe storage is a way to keep people safer. That amount of time that it takes to unlock a gun from what you are doing allows time for people to cool off, allows them to think about what they're doing allows law enforcement to enter without the risk of them being shot immediately. This is a good policy and it's definitely something we're going to be pursuing going forward. Candidate Copeland. Well, thank you. Uh, number one, I, I think we uh, have short memories about what the legislature did or didn't do on, on uh, safety. Uh, and, that, and particularly when it comes to schools. Uh, you know, I, I, I support school resource officers. Uh, we used to have quite a complement of those in St. Paul. The National Training Center is uh, right across the river uh, in Wisconsin, and uh, they pay for that training of our officers to uh, meet the challenges that are unique to uh, educational facilities. And the school board, the local politicians, and members of the legislature seem to have a problem with uh, dealing with that reality that they talk about 
existing. Uh, and I know something about it. Uh, down on the corner of uh, Payne and Cook, where I live, there was a uh, young woman who worked for one of our medical uh, specialists, was shot and killed as she was driving to a party uh, by a, a young person. Uh, across the street from me, we had a murder that took place. And the only thing I, you know, and there wasn't any storage issue. The guy just shot the woman right through the front door. And if Thank you, you. Thank okay. you for your comments. Pardon me? Oh, okay. We have time for one more question. Um, we'll make it an interesting one more personal. Um, what news sources do you rely on and how do you get information about the multitude of issues facing our citizenry which Minnesota legislators can address? And I will start with candidate Finke. I get my news from um, a wide variety of news sources. Uh, I read the paper, I, I read the Star Tribune, I read the, the Pioneer Press, I start close to home. I also read uh, national papers, Washington Post, you know. I read Fox News regularly, I read Alpha News regularly. I make sure that I am reading everything that is being said in our communities. I think it's extremely important. I also knock doors a lot. I talk to the people in my community. I wanna know what people think. I know there are a myriad of opinions in this state and in our district about all of the issues that we work on. Uh, and it's extremely important to me. You know, a lot of people say a lot of things about me, but I am dedicated to the First Amendment. I believe very deeply deeply in the First Amendment and the freedom of expression and religion. And when people, um, are not up on what is being said on the other side. They are not doing their jobs, I believe, in this role. So I take very seriously knowing everything I can about every opinion. Candidate Jama. Thank you. I would say I follow traditional media, newspapers, local, national, independent. I look at credible sources that could provide verifiable information and stick to the facts, not opinions. Uh, in that way, you will be proactive. You could see that the issues nationally, and you could prepare and take actions, such as in immigration. We know that southern states have issue with immigration, illegal immigration, and uh, we know that this is a drain of public resources. We believe in legal immigration and having an accounted illegal immigrant in a city will really strain the public resources. So always go with multiple resources, credible resources, independent resources. Thank you. Candidate Copeland. Well, as, as you might suspect I'm kind of a news junkie. Uh, and I uh, was glad to hear that Representative Finke is reading Alpha News. This is good. Uh, and we can recommend to you Real America's Voice if you're streaming. Uh, I, all, all of our local uh, stations uh, uh, are interested in what we're doing, sometimes not as much as we'd like them to be. Uh, but uh, then the news shows uh, with uh, Tom on Channel 5 and Esme over on 4, we love those little political shows, and of course, uh, Almanac, we're missing that tonight. I am an old Almanac person, I don't know, we only get about 20 minutes or maybe 10 minutes of politics now on that show. But, uh, uh, you know, you can't have too many news sources, and I miss the old East Side Review, and I miss a lot of the other uh, newspapers that we used to publish in this town, and, and I always wish that somehow the villager had been in my neighborhood and uh, the fact that that's no longer printed, uh, it's online, uh, you know. So, you know, if you're wanting to start a newspaper, I'll sign up. <laughs> Did I mention the Pioneer Press? <laughs> <laughs> Candidate Hollings. 
Thank you. I think everybody's covered all the news sources really well, so I'm not going to go over that again. But I also look at a lot of different news sources um, from a whole political spectrum. The one thing I will say is what I really value is working closely with my county and city partners and making sure that I understand what's happening on the ground within Ramsey County and within the city of St. Paul. And that's where I really get to learn a little bit more about what's happening with folks on the ground. Because I don't know if you all know this, but nobody knows who we are. Um, as a state representative, I've done this for four years now and people have no clue that I am their state representative. They think I'm like in DC or something and I'm not. Um, but they know who their city council member is. And when something goes wrong or they have an issue, they go to their city council member, they go to the mayor, they go maybe to their county commissioner if they're really active. And so being able to have a close relationship with them lets me know what things we can do at the state level to bring some funding to that, to maybe create some policy around it and make sure that we're addressing it um, equitably and fairly. And oftentimes when we're having an issue with something in St. Paul, they're having an issue with it in Bemidji or you know, uh, New Hope also. And so so it's a great way to create statewide Thank you. legislature. Okay. Now we are ready for our closing remarks. You will each have two minutes to address the forum and talk about your candidacy. We will start this time with candidate Copeland. Yeah. Well, I want to help out to my friends, uh, you know, get, get more popular. Uh, one of the items that uh, I picked out uh, for tonight that is uh, one that was sponsored by uh, Representative Hollins is uh, House File 4515. And what that's doing is repealing the six months of protection that we had in St. Paul as uh, people that buy gas and electric services uh, from taxation during the winter months. She offered a bill and it got passed. It was after midnight on uh, the 7th of May, I think it was. Um, and we're, we're out, we're done. It's, uh, you know, you get to pay now uh, your uh, franchise fees to the city of St. Paul 12 months out of the year. Now, of course, the mayor says, I only want two more months. But, they, but the legislation took away six months. How long do you think it's gonna be before the mayor uh, grabs that money, you know? Because guess what? He's already planning for $1.5 million more money that he can spend on Catch it now. Changing your gas stove to electric. And what's he going to do that for? To save you money on energy. I kid you not, it's right out of the budget. If you go to the budget page for the city, you can read it for yourself. This is not good government. There was one hearing in the House. Guess who showed up? The resilience officer for the city of St. Paul. One person. And we're doing away with legislation that protected the poor people of this city for 45 years. 45 years. We're throwing that out so we can fix the gas stove that isn't broken. And guess what? Gas is cheaper than electricity. So if you're trying to lower the poor people's bills, and I'm one of them, just don't try that hard again, please. And I'd love you to repeal uh, your uh, bad legislation there, uh, folks. Thank you uh, for your time. And I'll do time. it if I get there. Thank you for your time. Next, we will Thank go you. to candidate Hollings. Thank you. I wasn't going to spend all my time talking about uh, the franchise fee bill, but I guess I will. The franchise fee bill was repealed. St. Paul was the only city in the state of Minnesota that did not allow franchise fees throughout the other six months. Um, I have talked to the city of St. Paul and XL Energy. It's going to average about $5 a month for people, so it's not going to break the bank. And one thing I will note is that actually, Gas stoves are slowly poisoning our families and our children. And I know that's not a popular opinion because the gas industry did a terrific job of selling us on gas stoves, saying they were more efficient, saying they were better for the environment, saying gas is cheaper. But the reality is, you can look, there is science, there's a lot of news stories about it, that actually gas is slowly poisoning us and our families. And the reality is a lot of our low income citizens have gas that stoves that are leaking 
and that they are using to heat their houses instead of properly heating them, which means that they are at even higher risk of poisoning their children throughout the days. So I actually think this is a really important provision and I'm not ashamed of it at all. Um, I'm happy to have conversations with anybody who has questions about this because climate change and energy efficiency is one of my top priorities and that's what I plan on doing when I go back to the legislature, is making sure that we protect the most vulnerable among us from climate change and making sure that we are adapting to climate change as it hits us because this is our new reality. There is increased extreme weather. I mean, we're having sunny, warm days. I ate out on a patio today in October. Um, this is the reality that we're living in and it's gonna have consequences. And they're consequences that we can't even see right now. So we need to be prepared. We need to start storing that money away to make sure that we've got safe spaces for people to go when there are power outages and it's freezing cold or it's blazing hot. Because I don't wanna see people dying from exposure. I don't wanna see grandma and grandpa having to sit in a cold bath to make sure that they stay alive. That's not the world I wanna live in. I wanna live in a place where we can take care of our citizens. Thank you. And now, candidate Finke. Thanks again for the evening, uh, League of Women Voters and SPNN. It was a uh, enjoyable and robust conversation. I'm happy to be a part of it. Um, I am going to, should I be given the chance, I am going to go back to the Capitol. I'm going to continue to be the person that I was last time. I lead with my values. It's clear who I am. It's clear what I believe in. I think that we need to go back. We need to protect our bodily autonomy and reproductive justice. We need to build housing. We need to fund education. The things that we need to do need to continue happening. The state of Minnesota and its government is responsible to the people who we are in charge of taking care of. We need to do better about taking care of the people who live in our prisons. That's a real concern that we have. We have aging prisons literally falling down. I would love to work with members of the Republican Party who I know on the other side want to also see Stillwater closed. That's a priority for me. I wanna make sure that we are building education systems and spaces that are equitable for everyone. I wanna make sure that we are protecting the rights of people who are coming into the state of Minnesota. There are many reasons people are moving here, some of them because of trans refuge, many of them because they are refugees from other countries. It doesn't matter why you are arriving here. We wanna make sure that you are able to meet the needs of your family or yourself with housing, with jobs, sustainable, um, housing, insurance, the basic things that our community needs, it is our responsibility to make sure people have them and that's what I'm going to do at the Capitol. Thank you, and finally, candidate Jama, your closing statement. Thank you all for being a part of this lovely evening and lovely forum. At the beginning, I shared my background story because I believe uh, you all have very compelling story too. You're all working hard, you're trying to make your life better, just like I did. As an immigrant, as a nurse, as a small business owner, I understand the challenges we have in our community and what we face. If I am elected, I will focus on creating jobs, lowering taxes, keeping our streets safe, and making sure the government is working for you all, and spending money wisely. I believe in immigration, legal immigration. Legal immigration is a bridge to opportunity. Illegal immigration is a uh, back door. It's cutting corners, uh, not following law the fair process. Uh, I will support and promote equality and fairness. I'll make sure everyone has the same opportunity, and I think we already have that. And I will ensure the government listen to you, the people in District 66A. Uh, I, will, I want to represent all of District 66A, not certain group, I ask for your vote and 
please help me with feedback and put to make our community safer and successful state. Thank you, and I'm looking forward to earning your trust. Thank you. That concludes our forum. There's no rebuttal on closing the remarks. I'm sorry. Well, that's okay. We, we will not have rebuttal at closings. Um, and so if we are done with candidate comments at this time, I would like to thank many people for the work they have done to bring this forum to you. Of course, we need to thank all of our candidates um, for showing up and your intelligent discussion of issues that voters are concerned about. Special thanks to the League of Women Voters of St. Paul for all the work that they did to put this together. Thank you for the studio, for all of the work with the cameras, the lighting, the sound. We appreciate having this forum. And most of all, I would like to thank the voters, the voters that are here in the audience, the voters who will watch this program, on closed circuit TV or websites, voting is important. It's what makes our democracy run. And I hope that this forum has helped to inform you to make an intelligent and important vote in the upcoming election. Thank you all for this wonderful evening. Good night. <laughs>